The simple idea of we the people is to return to the founding vision embodied in the preamble to the Constitution that government is not our savior, the government is not our enemy. We the people create government as our instrument, as our meeting ground, as our resource, as our partner in addressing our common problems, in creating thriving communities, in building a democratic society. For the 21st century, that's a challenge that is urgent and possible. All of this points towards a call for citizenship, and I would say yeah, the reason why launching a citizenship movement tonight in Minnesota is appropriate is that this comes before the Martin Luther King weekend, the holiday weekend. <clears throat> it's always a powerful weekend for me. When I was uh, a young man in my teens and early 20s, I worked for the citizenship education program of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. My dad, who had been manager of the Atlanta Red Cross, went on the executive committee of SCLC in 1963. Um, and I worked across the South in those days of the movement. I heard Dr. King practice I Have a Dream the night before he gave the speech in Washington. I saw the great moments of going to the mountain. But I, and I think uh, I've always thought uh, Dr. King was one of the towering leaders of the 20th century. But I also think as a society, we often pay too much attention to Dr. King and other well-known leaders. As Martin Luther King put it again and again, the real heroes and heroines of the movement were everyday citizens in communities across the South who acted with stunning courage and determination and dedication and ingenuity and intelligence. Ordinary people who were garbage collectors and domestic workers, who were teachers and business owners, who were housewives and tenant farmers, who decided to show what first-class citizenship could mean. There was a, a way in which the movement was a school for citizenship, not only for the participants, for, but for the nation. In the words of the letter from a Birmingham jail, the movement was bringing the whole country back to the great wells of democracy which had been dug beat by the founding fathers and too much forgotten. I think we're in a moment like that. And the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, interestingly, has another parallel to this moment, an epical moment of change. Uh, it was formed in, in 1957, January 10th, to spread the Montgomery Way across the South. And Montgomery was a <clears throat> famous bus boycott in which thousands of black people marched and walked rather than ride the buses to protest the segregation of the buses and ended the segregation of the buses. But on a deeper level, the Montgomery Way meant a statement of citizenship itself, that actually people could act to end the system of segregation that was thought to be unchangeable, grounded in ancient history something that couldn't be changed. And I would say, today, in launching a We the People citizenship movement, the parallel is that in important ways we can talk about spreading the Minnesota way of citizenship more broadly across the country. It has, Minnesota way has lessons. Now what do I mean by that? Last year our Center for Democracy and Citizenship <coughs> partnered with a congressionally mandated national conference on citizenship to study patterns of civic engagement, voluntary rates, voting rates, charitable giving, helping out with neighbors, a variety of measures of <coughs> civic engagement. And Minnesota is the most engaged state in the nation. There are a few reports from last year here. <coughs> this year we we again partnered with the National Conference on Citizenship looking at the Twin Cities, which is the most civically engaged community in the country, and comparing it with Miami, which is the least according to the measures of the U.S. Census. I mean, just a few statistics are striking. 22% <clears throat> of residents of Miami participated in a community group. 
In Minnesota, it's close to 50%. 15% in Miami volunteer regularly. In Minnesota, 37% volunteer on a regular continuing basis and more than 50% volunteer sometimes of the year. In Miami, 9% donated or helped in a political campaign in Minnesota, the figure is 24%. Now there are many measures, there are 50 measures of looking at civic engagement, but Minnesota is a striking example for all of our challenges, all of our difficulties, all the ways we're not immune from the erosion of civic engagement, Minnesota has really remarkable patterns of civic uh, life and that uh, also continue to be revived. So we also analyze what is at work in Minnesota. It's not simply demographics that people have higher incomes and are more educated. That doesn't begin to explain it. In fact, in Minnesota, someone at the, at the bottom level of income with less than a college de uh, degree is more engaged civically than someone who has an advanced degree in Miami in the top tier of income levels. And similarly, while, while government works in Minnesota, as I'll describe, uh, government alone doesn't begin to explain the larger culture. So what we concluded is that there's a culture of civic empowerment in the Twin Cities that has three ingredients. The first is that Minnesotans and people in the Twin Cities and the suburbs continue to believe that actually citizens need to be at the center of public problem solving. The work of making healthy communities. In important ways, Minnesotans believe, in the words of Thomas Jefferson, that the only safe repository of the ultimate powers of the Republic are the people themselves. Now that seems a simple, in a some way uncontroversial concept, but in fact, in a mass culture that looks to supermen to fix things and asks what can we get in a kind of consumer mindset, it's strikingly unusual. And this really came home to me on September 20th when I'd just come back from South Africa and I watched the town meeting interaction between President Obama and voters who had voted for him. And the first voter who got up and spoke said, Mr. President, I voted for you, a man who said he was going to change things, who was going to bring a solutions to the middle class, and I'm still waiting. I'm getting disillusioned. I'm tired of defending you. And then a young man who just was out of law school said, Mr. President, I thought you were going to bring back the American dream for my generation. It hasn't happened yet. And I thought as I heard that town meeting on CNBC about the elephant in the room. The fact was Barack Obama did not run a presidential campaign on the idea that he was going to fix the nation's problems. Every speech he said, I can do only so much as president. We need a rebirth of citizenship. We need all hands on deck. Now, in that night, he gamely said all the things he had done. The media, after, after, the press, after the town meeting, said he didn't explain enough what he had done. But I kept thinking, this is really a statement about the whole culture. We've come too much as a society to look to supermen to fix things for us and to ask what we can get rather than what we can do together. So Minnesota still believes in significant ways in the Twin Cities that we can actually do things together. We can work across lines of differences. We can engage people who think differently and we can get things done. The second key element, um, again recalling Thomas Jefferson's insight, is that and learning needs to take place not only in schools, it needs to take place everywhere. First and foremost in families and in congregations and in businesses and in community groups. Not only schools, but to prepare people to deal with others who are different, to prepare people to think in longer term ways, to deal with ambiguity, to deal with open-endedness, to deal with the fact that life is messy and you make mistakes and you can learn from mistakes. <clears throat> and thirdly, the third ingredient, and I'm, I'm uh, delighted that Greg Connick can be here. Um, 
Minnesota still has strong, relatively strong examples of we the people government. Government which is not simply delivering services to people conceived as customers, but is our meeting ground, is our partner, is our catalyst, is our um, instrument in solving our problems. I've been involved in many, many civic initiatives over the last 20 years which show what people can do when they're given opportunity and space and challenge. I... So that's the premise of we the people. That we can build a citizenship movement built on the examples of the Twin Cities. There are a lot of other stories of work we've been involved with, like the Jane Adams School working with new immigrants in St. Paul that spilled over into a community-wide effort with the support of the mayor and uh, the school system and the teachers union and community groups so that everyone takes responsibility as educators of children. Or Bill Doherty's work uh, to rethink the nature of professional practice to once again be citizen professionals who work with people rather than simply do things for people. Or our warrior to citizen work which has worked across the state uh, about the integration of veterans coming back as citizens not as victims, not as people you feel sorry for, but it's actually full of talent and knowledge and insight and experience that can contribute to the civic life of communities. Or our work with athletes at the University of Minnesota and other places to think about their role as citizen athletes who have, because of their visibility and the way young people look up to them, a particular responsibility to take themselves seriously So for addressing America's problems. We cannot leave it up to political leadership. We can't pretend to be innocent. We can't pretend to be outside the equation. Fourthly, we want to identify and work with political leaders and political candidates who will be we the people candidates who will not overpromise, who will not pander, who will not infantilize, but who will say we are willing and we are interested and we want to be partners with citizens. And finally, we want to prepare the ground for candidate forums and interactions in 2012 if candidates overpromise, citizens challenge them. If citizens start whining about how we're not having all of our needs met, politicians challenge the citizens and say so we all have to think bigger and be bigger and remember the founding premise of our Constitution. We the people government. Right. So we'll press on for redemption.